Hello everyone, my name is Cynthia Emerson and I'm the DARE Program Manager. Welcome to our webinar. Also joining me today from Canary is Tom Vitez, Senior Director of Applications, Don McCullough, DARE Solution Architect, and Hervé Guy, Manager of Analytics and our French translator for today. Again, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for attending today's DARE webinar. This is one in a continuing series that we host quarterly. This webinar is being recorded and we made available online. We also will be making a PDF version of today's presentation available to all of our attendees. A couple of new procedures for you. If you have a question you would like to ask during our presentation, please go to the participants menu in Zoom and raise your hand. We will unmute you. We do want this to be collaborative, so please feel free to raise your hand at any time. We will also be providing a time at the end for Q&A using our question and answer text box where you can type your questions as well. And with that, I would like to introduce Hervé for the French introduction. Il n'y a pas de problème. Alors, bienvenue et merci à tous de participer au webinaire de la TIR aujourd'hui. Euh, ce webinaire est l'un un, d'une série que nous organisons à chaque trimestre. Donc, euh, notez que ce webinaire, comme le, les, les autres, est présentement enregistré et sera disponible en ligne à une date ultérieure. De plus, nous mettons également à la disposition des participants une version PDF de la présentation d'aujourd'hui. Elle sera là à une date ultérieure. Si euh, vous avez des questions que vous aimeriez poser pendant la, votre présentation, pendant la présentation, donc veuillez nous le, nous le dire via le menu des participants de l'application Zoom et d'utiliser l'icône « Lever la main » et nous activerons votre micro. Donc, euh, vous pourrez également utiliser la fonction « Message euh, » de questions et réponses du menu pour soumettre votre question en tout temps. Nous y répondrons à la fin de la présentation lorsqu'on sera rendu à la, à la pause « Questions et réponses ». Voilà. So on the agenda for today, we're going to take a few minutes to give you a few DARE updates. Uh, and then we will be talking about our booster pack uh, call for uh, expressions of interest for booster pack builders. And then we're going to move on to our demo. As I said before, we're going to leave you some time at the end for some Q&A. And then we'll wrap up with a couple of closing thoughts. So not a lot of news for you today, but we do want to speak a little bit about SurveyMonkey and Slack polling. For those of you who attended last month, we did introduce that we would be bringing polling to our Slack channel, and we are going to be using SurveyMonkey. So what that does mean for you is you do have to click a link and jump out of Slack to answer the question. It is really simple though. I do want to assure you that nothing's going to be put in the Slack channel that would take more than two or three minutes of your time. They are designed to be quick little polls that let us get uh, an understanding of what matters to you. So, um, for example, uh, booster pack builders. We are now looking actively for booster pack builders. And one of our questions, our first question that will be coming out in the next week or so, is of the booster packs under consideration, which ones would matter to you most? That would be an example of what we're going to be using the Slack polls for. I'd also like to encourage you to use Slack as a way to communicate um, back with us if there are topics that come to mind or you'd like to see us address a webinar. Please feel free to use the channel to communicate your thoughts and your, your feedback about how we can continue to evolve this program for you. And the second uh, update I wanted to, to bring forward is that we are now actively looking for booster pack builders, or we're continuing to actively look for booster pack builders. And with that, next slide. These are the areas that we've targeted. Uh, these, are, in fact, will be the, the ones we put in the Slack poll that I just spoke about uh, this week. Um, and if you have expertise in these areas, you know people who do, we are looking um, for uh, applicants to come forward and provide us with an expression of interest. This will be online shortly. Uh, we will be providing a mechanism to go through our website and just um, fill in an application or an expression of interest right on our website. But in the meantime, you can forward any uh, interest that you have to us directly through our uh, DARE email channel or Slack. Just pop into Slack and ask us for more information. And I'd be happy to send it, send it to you. Um, next slide. 
And, and why would you want to become a booster pack builder? There's a few benefits, uh, the principal ones being that it's a great opportunity for some exposure and some recognition for uh, an expertise um, for you as a small business, the, the opportunity to connect to new and potential partners and resources, and revenue. So a couple of things we do when you are selected to become a booster pack builder is we promote uh, the booster packs, as you know, on our website. Uh, there is a, a campaign around uh, the booster packs um, when they are released. And we've had a lot of our former um, builders really uh, benefit greatly from the exposure that they have gotten through this, uh, through this opportunity. Having said that, there is compensation available to you. It's under a fixed price contract. We provide um, an agreement and its compensation is $50,000 uh, if you are selected to come forward and provide a, a booster pack to our, our catalog. And generally the expectation is that we are looking to contract around five a year um, and we are looking at about a six month uh, delivery timeline once we have signed a contract with those selected to provide a, a booster pack. So again, if you have any questions whatsoever, please jump into Slack and uh, let me know and I'd be happy to connect directly with you if you'd like more information. And with that, next slide, we'll be turning the webinar over to Don to uh, go through his demonstration for you. Okay, so welcome to the webinar. Uh, um, I'm gonna cover the common problems that we see uh, with users provisioning instances and setting up environments today. Um, if there are questions, absolutely raise your hand and we'll get to your question. They do not have to be related to these topics. It can be another topic you're having issues with. These are the common ones that I help people with almost every day. Um, so uh, let's get started. I'll share my screen and I'll take you through things. Okay, you should be seeing the DARE console that you all log into and uh, similar, although your uh, errors will be lower because I actually try and cause problems in the environment um, and your failures will be zeros probably, but um, this is the status page and this is where you can see what's going on with your environment. Uh, the first thing I want to point out is I have pointed out in, in past webinars and in documentation that you need to set up your user settings for your Linux user. You need to put your SSH key in. Uh, you need to set a Windows user that is not administrator and a password in here under your user settings. Um, once you have done that, you also need to come down here to provisioning. And then provisioning, there's cloud init settings. And I regularly get asked, why is the the username D McCullough here instead of, or Dare Admin here, and I, I, is what it's changed to now. Well, the whole trick is that if this is not filled out, no instance will deploy. So I auto populate it. You're welcome to change it to whatever you want. You can use your username and password here and your key. Uh, but this is the settings that allow agent installs, access to logs, all that kind of stuff that you see in your environment. Administrator password for, password for Windows is also critical. If you deploy an instance, uh, a Windows instance without this filled in, you will not have administrator access on your Windows box. You'll have a user on the Windows box and you'll be able to log in, but you won't be able to do anything. Um, so those are two steps that are getting missed a lot. This second one especially is getting missed a lot. So let's, uh, that's just a heads up that these things need to be done before you get into provisioning instances and stuff like that. Okay. <clears throat> so now we're going to move on to um, Dare GPUs. Dare GPUs is where a lot of problems are happening. Um, the first problem that's happening is that um, people are not being careful when they're 
looking at the documentation on GPUs. I also am looking at the documentation to see if I can make it any clearer um, of what's needed. But I'm going to cover it here just so everyone has got a clear understanding. I've got a GPU deployed for some other issues that I want to show you, but we'll go through the, the, the deployment process, but won't deploy anymore. Um, I'm just going to select Ubuntu because it does not matter. Windows or Ubuntu. And then I'm going to select the tier, G, the tier GPUs. And we'll just call this testy123 uh, for the purpose of this. And oh, four. I already used that one. Um, and then you can select your version. It does not matter which version you choose, although I tend to go with the most current. Uh, some people have application needs that require the older version, so it's still there. This is one of the key points right here. We're working on getting this set so that it can be defaulted to local, but it must be local. To keep performance good, we developed the GPU infrastructure so the GPUs had local disk, so they got the top I.O. possible. We did not want volumes and a volume man, a volume uh, server providing the disk space over a network connection. Even a fast network connection is not going to give you optimum performance. <clears throat> the networks, the first one is networks, and that should be set to default. Quite often, people pick public here, and if you do that, your instance will fail to load, and you won't get. Uh, a clear understanding of why. Um, when it comes to availability zone, there's only one option, so you just select it. Security group, you select your, your tenant name security group. Uh, there will only be one there for you. There's two there for me because I have two different testing environments. Uh, group, server group affinity is not necessary. We don't have it in our environment because we never intended the environment to support more than one GPU per tenant. And floating IPs is always public. <clears throat> Once you're set up like that, local in your volumes, default in your network, floating IP to public, and availability zone to Nova and your security group set, then you can click next. At least I think you can. Interesting. Okay, I'm not sure why that's happening, but I will look into it after the fact. <laughs> uh, Tom just gave me a hint there. Thank you, Tom. Yes, I already have one GPU, so I can't go beyond that point. It's okay. Going beyond that point is really only a matter of saying yes and complete. And you've probably all seen it if you've deployed an instance. If not, there is nothing uh, scary there. There's nothing you have to do other than click the OK button. So the next topic on GPUs I wanted to cover was we had identified in our documentation that you needed to install um, the drivers and attach a license to your GPU. And honestly, due to a mistake on our part, um, the link that was associated with that had changed and I didn't notice. So several of you may have tried to and not got and not realized it was important, but quite often we had, uh, early on we had GPUs where they weren't licensed and they weren't, uh, the drivers weren't properly installed. 
Now, in some cases, they got the drivers installed, but they didn't get the licensing installed. And if you don't get the licensing installed, you have limited GPU capacity. And so from that perspective, uh, what I wanted to point out to you was that we're, there's going to be a new document updated in like tomorrow or the next day that's going to have um, this process. And I'm going to post this process to the Slack, Slack channel uh, so that anybody that has a GPU can get the full performance they expect from the GPU. So when it, you come in here and go to Dare GPU, you'll see that there's now a script, a set of scripts for Ubuntu, a set of scripts for CentOS, and a process for Windows GPUs. Now, what you do is basically uh, click on these, copy the script, and come over and well, let's get to the GPU one. And you'll notice I've got a GPU installed.sh here. You have VI, the file name you want to call it. Um, I suggest something like this and paste the script in. Then it's simply a matter of writing that file and then chmod space u plus x to, to add execute and then your file name. Um, uh, always use sudo. Um, and that will change the permissions to allow it to be an executable. And then dot forward slash GPU will, will execute that file. And once that file is finished, your drivers will be installed. Testing your driver installs is the next thing you want to be able to do. And to do that, you cd to this directory. And I've already done this, but I will show you the command. Uh, there is a command that you run uh, to make any of these tools and CUDA samples. Uh, there's probably 30 of them in here under six different sections. One is utilities, two is like, um, other applications and three and four and five, I think. Um, the make files are there, but this device query is not there. So sudo make will create that, but I already created it um, to save us having to sit around for that. So once it's created, then all you do is dot forward slash device query. And it will tell you, you've got the right driver installed you've got this many CUDA cores, your clock rates. It'll give you all the details about your GPU. So this, it, if this directory doesn't exist and you can't find it, it's because you haven't got the drivers installed. Now, after September 1st, we implemented new images that have all this installed. We had some bugs with that originally, but we got it worked out. And now any GPU you install is automatically um, configured with the right drivers and set up with a license. And so you have everything you need to get started. GPU instances before September 1st, if you didn't do this, you need to do it. So like I said, I will put the, the process to do this on the uh, Slack channel and pin it so that you can get to the pins and see it. Um, if you have any problems, let me know. Reach out to me on Slack. I'll always be there to help. <clears throat> Thank you.
Okay, so the next one is security groups. So another thing that's happening in the environment that uh, is causing frustration for you guys and gals is security groups. By default, you get your, your tenant security groups, but every once in a while you want to do a custom one and you want to do custom one. You want to create a custom security group. The first thing you need to know about custom security group is although this is here, it is not allowed in all clouds. The only cloud where you're allowed to create custom security groups is AWS. If you select all, your security group will not work. AWS Canada is the only place where you can create your own custom security group. They're the only one that allow it. And their test tenant is the VPC. Well, your tenant name is the VPC that you want to assign that security group to and save changes. After you've created that security group and you come in here, you can assign this to instances, but you need to be aware of one thing. And that is this rule is required for our server that you log into to communicate with your instances for things like console, for things like logs in the interface that you can look at, for um, health and, uh, and details on, on issues on your instance or errors in the logs. Any of that data requires this, this rule. So all you need to do is make sure that you come into one of your default security groups that was set up by my scripts and copy that IP address, come to your custom security group and make it your first rule. Custom rule, TCP, zero to 65535, and network, and command V, and instances is the proper destination. That is any instance in your VPC. If you want to change that, of course you can, but be aware that things get much more complex here and save changes. So now that security group rule is in there, you can add any other security group rules that are here and add a custom one to any instance you want and all functions will work the way you expect them to. Uh, um, is to have two instances in a uh, in the same environment talk to each other. AWS and Azure work this way, and you need to set up a rule to allow them to talk. No, no instance can talk to another instance. Even if you put two AWS instances in AZ one in your VPC, they will not talk to each other until there's a security group rule. If you want those instances talking to, to each other, then you simply add a rule. The basic rule is to allow inter-instance talking. So you just want all instances to be able to talk to each other. It's a custom rule. And it's, you'd have to create a UDP one if you need UDP ports or ICMP if you need one at ICMP. But the port range is whatever you want. And in this case, I will say um, <clears throat> 22 to 
443. That covers SSH to HTTPS and anything in between. Um, and instead of the source type network, you set the source type security group. Oh, no, it's not. It's network. It is 10.10.0 slash 26. Forgot to show you how to get that. In provisioning instances, if you come to each of your instances, you can get their private IP network address from here. You can then go to infrastructure networks and you can see your networks. And See, I got it wrong. So it's best to come in here and grab that. And this is just a rule to allow communication between two instances in the same AZ. But we edit this and we just that in. And now what we're saying is any IP address, any instance from this subnet can go to the same network. There you go. And what that will do when you save it is allow any instance from that subnet to talk to any instance on that subnet on these ports. So if you only need one port, just put the one port in. If you need a couple of ports, then add a couple of rules if you want to keep it just to those couple of ports. <clears throat> but that shows you some of the gotchas. If you're having gotchas of your own, don't hesitate to reach out. Okay, so one of the other things that happens is the Dared Min uh, security group rule is not associated with an instance, and this happens. We're going to go to this instance, and you'll notice there's no console tab here. If I go to my other instance, you'll see that there's a console tab here. And I can go to the console and the console will load and I get a console into my instance. Well, on this one, there is no console. And that's because when the instance was deployed, the security group rule didn't allow the instance to talk to Morpheus. And so Morpheus didn't get all the data it needed in order to get this instance set up. Now, if I hadn't restored the rules, so this would actually work uh, when I did this test, this would be a dash, like this dat last backup, because it couldn't have got a health update. And you would have errors. And that's what those errors were in, in my dashboard was me creating this scenario. The way to fix this is, um, at instances, when you come in, this is a high level look at your environments that you've created and where you've created them. And the name of the uh, cluster that or, or instance that is inside this space. When you click on that, then you get to this view and you'll see down here that you have one VM in this in this environment. 
you could, if you had set the, the capacity to two VMs or three VMs, then this would, all three VMs would show up in here under VMs under this one single entity. So each VM, you would have to do this too. First, you click on the VM that you want to edit. You edit the VM. And what doesn't get set because it can't communicate with it is the RPC host. The validation that it can communicate with it is what allows this RPC host to be populated. If you didn't have a security group rule for dare admin access, then you wouldn't have this RPC host in here. When you take the external IP and make it the RPC host and save, all of a sudden, when you come back to instances and you click on that instance again to reload it, you have a console port. And if you click on the console port, it'll work. And you're all set. <clears throat> okay, so now that I've covered that, the last thing that's coming up all the time is people are asking, how much do we have to spend? What's my budget? And the answer is $300 a month is what you have to spend in there. Any way you like, you can spend it. One, in one big instance, three, four, five, six really little instances, whatever works for you. Um, but the way you can track that is under operations budgets. Here, you click add. Name your budget. It'll already be scoped to your account, so you don't need to worry. And all are already be scoped to the year and the interval will be automatically scoped to month. Type 300.0. Copy that and paste it in each month. Save it. And then you'll have a budget. And you'll be able to see. You can see I have gone a little over budget. <laughs> But in general, I'm sticking to that budget now. But you won't, you are curtailed in that the environment will stop you from deploying more than $300 worth of infrastructure. Um, so don't worry. Uh, we take care of keeping you under budget, but you will be able to see the percentage of the budget you're using. Like in September, I've only used $61. So I've got lots of money to work with. So you won't see this problem. And if you do reach out to me, because there's something wrong. But I'm, I don't believe anybody in the environment today could see this happen. So either way, it is our job to keep you under budget. So with that said, I believe that covers everything I wanted to cover. I owe you some updates in the Slack channel and some updates to documentation, which I'll get to you over the next few days. Um, I can open the floor to questions at this point. Uh, Don, there's some questions in the Q&A if you're able to see those. Okay, let me take a look. Uh, here we go. Let me get back here. Okay. Okay. Uh, to the anonymous attendee, please send an email to dare.admin at canary.ca and I will send you a Slack channel link. No problem at all.
Oh, and Dodd, would you be able to read the questions out before I answer them as well, just so we have uh, for all the yep. attendees who might not be able to see them? Awesome, thank you. If I've already used volume for my storage, how can I change that to local? Oh, well, actually, um, if you have a GPU where you've used volume for your storage, your GPU probably timed out before it fully deployed because the environment has to uh, deploy a volume on our volume server and it needs to um, <laughs> it needs to install an OS on it, uh, the OS uh, from uh, the image onto that volume uh, and then install the image. Um, so it, by the time it's done all that, usually the instance deploy is timed out and we've got errors. Um, so Joe, if you have an instance where the volume successfully deployed, you're lucky. Uh, there is no way other than backing up your data and respinning an instance to fix that problem. But reach out to me and we'll take a look. Also, Don, we had someone raise their hand. Uh, I believe that was Steve. Uh, Steve, I'm going to allow you to talk uh, to ask Don your question. Cool, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm Sent a question via the Q&A, you didn't, uh, I don't know if you received it or not, but uh, it's a question about whether the budgets uh, take into account power scheduling, like if I have a uh, high cost instance, but I only run it 30% uh, of the day, I, I should be able to run three of those uh, instances uh, at, at just by time scheduling them? Um. Time scheduling isn't supported at this point. Uh, there is a feature release that's coming that will allow us that capability. Uh, at present, if you go above the $300 a month um, um, projected costs, for an instance, you can't deploy. Um, it is our goal to get that feature enabled, but at present, it's not there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that being a useful one because sometimes the, uh, like, like say you have a, an instance that may be uh, $100 a month, but you may only use that for a quarter of the day or something. So it's really not taking uh, into account the fact that you're, well, you only want to use it at a certain time. Right. No, I agree. And it was part of our original goal. It's not part of the original capabilities. And we've been driving for uh, enhancements to allow that kind of capability. And they're coming in a new release, which is now in beta. So okay. we should see it soon. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I think I saw another question here from Irving. I'm just going to allow, unmute you, Irving, and feel free to ask Don. Thank you. Uh, I sent this uh, question from uh, via the Q&A, but uh, I don't know if it, uh, it's uh, received. Uh, just uh, a similar question uh, as Steve uh, raised. Uh, I, I missed it at the beginning of the, the budget part. Uh, what's the limit uh, uh, of setting it? Uh, the limit is $300 per month. That's what the hard limit is on every account in, in DARE. Um, but, um, and, and so that's what you set in the uh, amounts. Um, all this is is giving you a tracking um, and allowing you to see what your spend actually looks like um, and uh, be more clear about where you are today and what, what happens when you make changes in your environment. Um, so, sorry, it, it means I can uh, uh, set it up to 300. I can set the lo uh, lower than that. Yes. Okay. Okay, if that's um, your question, Irming, we, we can hop back in the Q&A panel here, Don. I think uh, Joe Jansen has the next question right here. 
Um, what is the next question? The next question I have is how do you create your VMs? I have an instance, but can't create a VM. Um, each, each deployment is deploying a VM, but the way they look in Morpheus is multi-layers deep. So what you're looking at here is um, your um, instance view. And if you click on your instance, you'll see the VM view. But at the instance level, you could have multiple VMs if you wanted to. And the way you would do that if you wanted two instances, in the, sorry, two VMs in the same instance group is during an add, just grab that for ease of use. <clears throat> Click next. In this screen, is it advanced options? Yep, scale factor. You can set the scale factor to two or three. And I'll do nanos, set things up. So we set that to two and click next, next, complete. And what you'll see here now is you'll see this is progressing and you'll see your instance view is, looks like it's one, but at the VM level, there's going to be two. So if you give this a few minutes, what's going to happen is the VM will have another instance here in a minute. We won't wait for it because that can take a little while, but Eric, we can move on. But what will happen here is you'll get two VMs listed here once the first VM is deployed. Okay, sounds good. Well, the next question we have is from anonymous attendee. If I created my GPU instance before September 1st, 2020, will the GPU license get applied automatically when you execute the driver install script or is the license activation on a separate step? Yeah, there's two scripts. Um, let me go to Dare GPU to see that there's an Ubuntu drivers, which will install the drivers and tweak the, um, the license. And then you also have to install the desktop if you're before that time, because there's no Ubuntu desktop on your instance. <clears throat> and if it's a Windows instance, then you have to follow the Windows process if it's before September 1st. That'll get you, you get you the full performance you're able to have from the GPU. Okay, if that answers that question, the next one we have is from an anonymous attendee. If my account goes over budget, will I get charged by Canary? No, it is our goal to keep your account under budget and keep our budget within budget. Um, as a result, we are very careful about doing reports on the active utilization and any over budget situations and correct them quickly. Um, they do happen from time to time. It's uh, less often now, but it's it's made some growing to get it working right. But it now pretty much keeps everybody in budget all the time. Okay. Um, the next, I believe it's just a comment from Steve, uh, a follow-up on his previous question, which is talking about an example of a high cost instance that runs only 30% of the day. 
Uh, I'm not sure if you have any other um, uh, comments on that, Don. No, that's that's the answer I have. Is that um, the ability to run high cost instances based upon your consumed rate of spend is a feature that is not in our current version of of Morpheus. Um, it is coming, and uh, we will be able to offer that. Um, but that is in a future release that's in beta right now and probably won't be production until November, December time. Right? Okay, the next question we have here is, is there any limit to set the budget? Yes, the budget should be set to $300 per month. Looking through the remaining questions here, Joe made a comment saying it did spin up fine and he will contact you for any further advice yep. that's needed. Great to hear that. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions? Uh, either raise your hand in the attendee tab or feel free to type in a question here in the Q&A. Okay, I'm not seeing any more hands raised or any more questions coming in. So Cynthia, feel free to uh, take over when you're ready. Great, well, thank you, Don. That was uh, extremely interesting and I hope everyone enjoyed the, uh, the webinar. Um, our closing thought for today, uh, ultimately progress and innovation win. So um, great closing thought. Our next slide, please. So they said, we are really working hard to make sure that we're bringing you the topics uh, that are interesting to you and are the most relevant for where you are. Uh, so if you have any suggestions for an upcoming webinar, um, please let us know. Just uh, send us an email or drop it into Slack. We will be uh, working on our next topic after we hear from you folks and post it in email as soon as we have determined a date and we'll let you know. And with that, I thank everybody for coming and look forward to seeing you all at our next webinar.